welcome. Thank you for coming to listen to the Lichen Sclerosis Podcast. My name is Kathy, and this is our journal of learning about and living with lichen sclerosis. Each week, I research or talk to someone about an aspect of lichen sclerosis and bring you the information so you don't have to go searching. And this week, I'm so excited to finally publish this episode with Ashley Stump. She's a pelvic floor physical therapist who knows all about lichen sclerosis and is here to share her knowledge with you. I learned so much during this episode. It is full of gold nuggets. We talked about what pelvic floor physical therapy is, why women with lichen sclerosis need it, what to expect on your first visit. We talked about lubes. We talked about so much, so much gold. And she even gave us tips on what to look for when you're looking for a new pelvic floor physical therapist and some resources on where to find one. So you do not want to miss this episode. And make sure you listen all the way to the end if you want updates on what's happening with our sponsor, the Lichen Sclerosis Support Network, who are working towards getting people diagnosed earlier and getting treated better. Without further ado, Here's my conversation with pelvic floor physical therapist, Ashley Stump. This information is for educational purposes and does not constitute medical advice. Speak to your medical professional before making any changes to your care. First things first, the one question that popped into my mind when somebody sure. says, you need pelvic floor physical therapy when you have lichen sclerosis. I'm yeah. thinking, okay, LS is, uh, it affects the skin of my vulva. What the mm -hmm. hell is pelvic floor physical therapy going to do for me? Yeah, that tell is us, a great question. <laughs> what is up with PFPT and LS? Perfect. Okay. So just to kind of start it off with pelvic floor, like what even is pelvic floor PT? Because not anyone, not everyone really even knows about it. So technically, pelvic floor muscles, you know, they're the muscles on the base of the floor of the pelvis, and they have all of these different functions. They help keep pee and poop off the floor. They can help with pelvic organ prolapse. They contribute to intimacy and sexual function. And so there's all of these different roles that the pelvic floor muscles play. And so just like a muscle that we can see, so like our bicep or quadricep in our leg, they act like those muscles. And so just how people hold stress in their neck muscles, mm -hmm. people okay. can hold stress in their pelvic floor muscles. Just how people can strengthen their bicep, people can strengthen their pelvic floor muscles. And just how people can hold tension in their bicep or their quad or their neck muscles like I do when I have stress, people can have tension in their pelvic floor muscles. So specifically with LS2, as the tissues are changing, scar tissues forming, you know, tissues are becoming fibrotic. Pelvic floor PT can help those tissues become more extensible and help increase blood flow to the tissues okay. by like gentle stretches, gentle scar mobility. Um, I tell people, cause it's hard to imagine the pelvic floor muscles, right? We can't see them. Not like yeah. you can look at your arms. So they're really abstract. Um, so I tell people, you know, if you, someone got an ACL, and their leg. Okay. So they had surgery for their leg. Scar tissue automatically forms with that. And so when, if I was treating, you know, a PT treating an ACL surgery, they would have a scar and I would work on the scar to help decrease the scar tissue that's forming and to make the, and help the scar become more mobile. And so that's going to affect the muscles around it. If the scar tissue is really stiff, that's going to restrict the muscles by that scar and basically help restrict their function in a sense and decrease their function. So with LS, pelvic floor PT can help gently, you know, work on the tissues, work on the muscles there that might have tension to then prevent people from having pain with intimacy or functional penetrative activities, whatever that looks like for them. And to ultimately help, you know, increase blood flow and extensibility to it. That makes way more sense. 
I, cool. I, that was I, a lot. <laughs> I can get that. I get that now, especially the part about the scar tissue, because I know from a previous conversation that I've had with um, Dr. Jill Kraft, and if you haven't heard that episode, definitely go back. It is a must listen if you have LS. I learned that a lot of the reason that we have pain with sex is because there is scar tissue forming at the base of the vagina. And then when you are having um, intercourse, penetrative intercourse, you are tearing that. Right. Then if you're not using your medication properly, it's just refusing and scarring all over again. And you're just repeating this process. And the more you repeat it, the thicker the skin, that scar tissue becomes Mm -hmm. until the point where you can't even tear it anymore. And now you just can't have sex. Right. Yeah. And it's that cycle of, you know, kind of the pain cycle with that too, of if you're creating quote unquote trauma to the tissues with re-tearing the scar tissue, muscles, the body doesn't like pain. So right. muscles, whenever someone has pain, muscles naturally want to protect and they want to guard. And so they tense up trying to protect the body from, you know, what is coming at the muscles, the stimulus that the muscles right. interpreting as danger. And so public for PT kind of works on those muscles and helping them to adapt to non-threatening situations or non-threatening stimulus stimuli that's coming at the muscles in order to then decrease that pain cycle from happening. So then as the muscles get more comfortable with a stimulus, and we'll talk about trainers and dilators, which kind of goes into this, but as the muscles get more comfortable with that stimulus, whether it's my finger, you know, working on the tissues or trainers, then they might interpret penetrative activities. The goal is that's not going to be as threatening And then they're going to stay relaxed. So then their nervous system and the person's nervous system isn't getting so heightened in interpreting this as danger, but interpreting it as a safe space. So then activities can happen pain-free. That makes a lot of sense. So do you find with those, those muscles being triggered like that, when you first start working with women with lichen sclerosis, that not only is the scarring at the at the base of the vagina a reason for the painful sex but also those tense muscles can um is that also like kind of what causes vaginismus is those like you cannot penetrate it like a lot of women say they i couldn't they couldn't get the speculum in when they went to the doctor yeah. it felt like they were hitting a wall That's yeah what they said. Is that, so that's those muscles? Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. So there's three layers of the pelvic floor muscles, you know. And so with vaginismus, in a sense, it's a reflexive contraction where the muscles, as if any stimulus is coming in, the muscles just kind of shut it off and basically reject it in a sense and won't allow a stimulus to be penetrated, whether it's a speculum or a penis or whatever. Um, And so, yeah, it usually goes hand in hand of Mm -hmm. scar tissue, but when someone has pain, the reflexive contraction tensing up happens. I call it like the subconscious. So you said the the tissues, the muscles react. I say it's the subconscious that are causing the muscles to react. And yeah. it's giving that it's saying, okay, this is painful. And my job is to reduce the pain that my host has, my person. Right. And so if I associate sex with pain, then we're, I'm going to do whatever I have to do to not have sex. And that is, we're going to close those muscles totally. up and, and there's not going to be any sex, which means totally. there's not going to be any pain. <laughs> yes, exactly. And the body, the body holds emotions in the muscles. The body holds trauma in the muscles and or in the body, you know, so that mind body connection, even though pelvic floor PT is treating muscles, I incorporate nervous system training, the mind muscle connection, mind body connection, so important, especially for intimacy and, you know, those activities, whatever it looks like. When do you think is the right time for a woman with LS specifically to Mm -hmm. start pelvic floor physical therapy? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's hard because LS is so individualized. Mm -hmm. So I can only, you know, talk in general, basically what I see clinically. But gold standard for LS is medical professionals in conjunction with pelvic PT. So I encourage 
for those that have LS just to find a public PT to get on your network, on your board, on your, on your health team. You might not, you know, it might be fluctuations, right? It might be, okay, right now I'm having painful intimacy. Like I think I need to get screened and checked out. So then once you have a public health person on your team, then you can get screened, you can get treatment. And then, you know, a couple months or so down the road, you might be good. And then, but still you have that person on your team. So then, you know, in the future, you always can go back to that person, your public health PT, as you're going through this journey of having right. OS. Yes, mm-hmm. I, yes, I call it a journey as well. And I, um, I'm always preaching that it takes a team. Yeah, you know, it's not totally. just one. It's not just your LS doctor who's helping right. you. You need, a, you know, you need to see a therapist, a counselor. You need a pelvic yeah. floor physical therapist. Totally. You, need, you know, you need all of these people working together to get you healthy again. Totally. So I and love that. I like to also like say, you know, find someone that you vibe with. Like it's yes. so important that you find a pelvic health PT. I mean, any doctor, honestly, on your health team. But since I'm talking about public health PT, finding someone that, that you vibe with. And if you don't, like, let's say you talk to them on the phone, like call them, get to know them or your first appointment. If you don't feel comfortable, like you have the total right to just keep searching because that's going to ultimately help your health journey. If you can trust your public for PT and vibe with them as, as you progress and, you know, go on. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Especially since this person is, is basically going into your most intimate parts. Totally. I mean, yeah. You know, there, there's not a lot of people that are not that you're not sleeping with that see your vulva, right? Or, do, or that touch your vulva or stick their, you know, fingers totally. inside yes. of you. So yes. you absolutely have to have a, a trust and be able to have this connection with this person yes. um, that you feel confident in what they're doing, that they're looking out for your best interests, that you totally. feel confident in their education. Yeah. Um, so what is, are there some questions that we should be asking when we're looking for a pelvic floor physical therapist? That's a good question. So I would I would ask, you know, ask them their experience if they know what lichen sclerosis is, if they have experience treating it. Um, I would ask like for them to maybe talk through what it might look like for their initial evaluation um, just to get a heads up of if the person, you know, if there's a chance for an intravaginal assessment, if the PT likes to do that on the first time or have them talk through what that would look like from that pelvic health PT's perspective of what that might look like. I find that that's really helpful. And I, no matter who ever calls me, I tell them, this is what you could expect on your first time. You know, and if you're not comfortable, we don't have to do that. But there's a chance that that could be a possibility in the future for an intervaginal assessment or an external assessment. Yeah. So I would encourage them to ask those questions for sure. So let's go through what is your typical first time evaluation with a woman with lichen sclerosis. Yeah. Walk us, walk us through what that would be for with you. Cause I know like you okay, said, yeah. there's different, everybody's different, but. Totally. Yeah. Everyone's so individualized, but kind of in general, I always tell patients, you know, today is going to be a lot of talking. Um, I'm going to figure out your whole health journey and the floor is yours. So tell us to me from the very beginning of your journey, like what does it look like for you? What are your symptoms right now? What are you feeling? So at the beginning, we do a ton of talking. I ask a lot of questions. And then from there, I also say I like to look at the body from head to toe. So I say I might watch you walk, watch you just because musculoskeletally, things can affect the pelvis, even though lichen sclerosis mainly affects, you know, vulva and everything. I still look at the body from head to toe too, just to find some muscle imbalances that could contribute to certain symptoms. Um, And then sometimes I take flexibility, strength of like legs. And then I always say, based on your comfort level, there is a chance for an intravaginal assessment this session. Um, And then I explain that. Just for everyone that's listening um, with me, it's finger and lubricant. There's no speculum, there's no stirrups, nothing like that. Um, And it's a way for me to assess directly the pelvic floor muscles. And so based on the person's presentation, um, if they're just comfortable with me externally looking or maybe palpating and feeling the vulva externally for fibrotic tissue, scar tissue, totally okay. That's 
definitely okay. I can also still get a lot of information if they're not comfortable with that. Um, even if it's just observing the tissue, you know, externally, coaching them through a Kegel, coaching them through lengthening, which would be like if you're going to pass a bowel movement, you lengthen those muscles. Oh. Um, that gives me an idea of kind of what the muscle's presentation is and what, you know, the coordination is like. If someone has a lot of tension, they may not be able to lengthen those muscles as optimally as we want because the muscles are just in a shortened, tense position, right. in other words. And then for the intravaginal part, finger and lubricant, and then it's a way for me starting superficial, rest at the opening, and then assessing right and left the pelvic floor muscles. And I tell them it's open communication. You know, if you're, if it's painful, I'll always let you know before I go deeper. Um, and then if you want me out of your vagina, like open communication between patient and I always, that would be basically kind of a rough draft generally of an initial evaluation. Do you ever ask like, um, have they had any sexual trauma? Oh, for sure. Yeah. So before that, there's screening questions of okay. any trauma or injuries to the pelvis that I don't know about, any history of sexual abuse, sexual trauma, um, any history of STDs or STIs. And then I always offer a chaperone in the room too to sit if they would be more comfortable if someone else was also in the room during during the assessment. Okay. Mm-hmm. Do you play any kind of music or anything like that? Oh, man, that girl, be- that is... That is my goal. So I have been working really hard on my treatment room. I like have dim lighting now. I like have really encouraging stuff on the walls. Like I have been just revamping it. My next, my next little goal is to find a speaker. The thing is, where I treat, there's not a lot of service. So like, and okay. we don't have Wi-Fi. So I have to figure out just an iPod. I got to get a little iPod and a speaker. And my goal yeah. is to have that, like, just the soothing, soothing music. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I would see how that would kind of help to calm the body. Totally. And get in a, in a good mood. So um, That's so funny you said that. It's, like, literally my next step. <laughs> okay. I like it. So when I come see you, you know, yeah. I'm going to have the music. I will there. try to have the music, but yes, <laughs> that's my goal. <laughs> awesome. Does pelvic floor physical therapy help with any clitoral adhesions, mm. clitoral fusing, because I know yeah. we talked about, you know, uh, fusing and scarring at the base of the vagina, but right. what about the clitoris? Yeah, so yeah, it does. And it's just, it's very similar to, you know, if scarring was at the base or of the opening, the perineal body, um, gentle scar tissue release, gentle, basically, how do I say it, like soft tissue massage in a sense, to try and decrease that fibrotic tissue and basically to the degree of that. So it's very gentle, um, but it can help. It's, those tissues are very similar to the tissues, you know, at the base. They're a little more sensitive, obviously, yeah. but um, yeah, can, can help with those symptoms as well. Can you tell us a story of somebody who has, that, that you've been able to help and yeah. like where they started and where they yeah. ended? Yeah, so... I have a, I mean, I have multiple patients that have pain, you know, pain with intimacy. Mm-hmm. And so I just think of a specific case. So, mm-hmm. you know, first, first thing, initial evaluation, unable to have intimacy. So functional penetrative activities, intercourse, okay, with right. this specific patient, um, penis into vagina. And so unable to, and then nervous system really heightened. So like very fearful and then that plays a role on self-esteem and, mm-hmm. and how she views herself and um, negative self-talk. And so then it was affecting her relationship. And so the first evaluation was a lot of a lot of just education about, you know, the nervous system in itself and how the nervous system also plays a role with everything and, and muscles and all of that. And so we started very, very gentle on perennial body, um, stretching it a little bit. And then we moved that. So then it was able to insert with my finger and lubricant and assess all the muscles. And they were sensitive to her. Some were painful. And when I was evaluating, definitely tension was there. I like to describe it to patients as a muscle that doesn't give. So like if you would push on a relaxed muscle, the skin under it would give in a sense. Yeah, but a yeah. tense muscle, yeah, it's like a knot. It's a, like you know, hard, like when you pulled it yeah. and it's just hard. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yep. So so her, some of her pelvic floor muscles were like that. 
And then whenever I feel that, I like to tell them, like, I never want them to be in more than like a three out of 10 pain when I'm assessing them. I don't want them to be white knuckled, feeling like they got to push through it. So um, it's really gentle massage. And then um, with my finger, you're kind of just going along the fibers um, of the muscle. And then I can physically feel the decrease in the tension, which usually correlates to them having less sensitivity of that muscle than when we started. So it was a, it was a quite a few sessions of my finger working on those muscles. And then we got to a point to where after my finger was pretty benign and non-threatening to her, we were progressing that to vaginal trainers or dilators. And so we were, I asked her, you know, what is functional for you? Like with these dilators, what's functional? What's the size that we need to get to to be functional for you? So we progressed through that. And this whole time, you know, we're working on mind body connection. I always say we strengthen the wrinkles in the brain um, to have her like attuned to what I'm doing because that's helping strengthen the wrinkles that the wrinkles. So the brain that corresponds to the pelvic floor muscles and a sense to get that. that connection stronger. And so we went through vaginal, the vaginal trainers, and then I met with her and her husband pretty early, early on to um, just kind of talk and have been, have him be on the health team with me because yes. he's just a part of it, if not more than me. Oh, you know? absolutely. Yeah. So I met with both of them at the beginning, which was very beneficial, um, I feel like, for them and for them to and him to feel like he's a part of it. And his goals matter to me too, you know? And so, um, yeah, so we went through the trainers and then she, there's something called sensate focus, which is like a graded introduction, I guess, to more functional penetrative activities. Okay. So it's graded and it's a way that is non-threatening. It should be like a no pressure, no goal of climax, no goal of orgasm or anything like that. They were working through that together as I was treating her. And then, Now she is pain-free. She is having the best sex life. These are her words, the best sex life that she's ever had. I love that. I love that very much. Yeah. One of the members in my group, she just went through a four-month journey with dilators. She She hadn't had sex in a year and a half because it was so painful. Yeah. And she she followed um, a pelvic floor physical therapist protocol is a book um called uh sex without pain Mm -hmm. by pelvic floor (laughs) dr heather jeffcoat Uh uh-huh she did it for four months and now she's like a nymphomaniac she's having this is the first time she said in 19 well that she could ever remember in the 19 years that she's been having sex that she does not have an ounce of pain that's amazing she she has multiple (laughs) orgasms that's amazing multiple times a week and i love that that's amazing and yeah that's how you know that's very similar because the the patient i'm specifically talking about said her whole life she's had pain but she just thought it was it was the normal, you know, right. she just had to put up with it. And, right. and so rewiring the brain in a sense to, to think of, to think of sex as, as non painful is a I process too. That. I love the fact that not only are you working on the tissue and the muscles, but you're working on the subconscious and the brain and the, like you said, the, the self identity, the yeah. self consciousness. I mean, not the self conscious, but yeah, I guess the self conscious, yeah, the basically. ego, the, Right. You know, the self confidence, totally, um, because that is huge, and yeah. especially with women with LS. Like just for me personally, sure, that was a major, major thing for me. Is that my my self esteem went from I just knew I was the shit, and I knew I was hot, and to yeah, where I was just like, eh, okay. I guess you're not that hot. And, you know, and then I started treating myself differently. And I, you know, I had lost 50 pounds and I gained the 50 pounds back. plus some. And it's been a process just to get back to where I feel that self-confidence. So love the fact that you're working with these women, not only to, to bring back those those relaxed muscles and to make that space in the vaginal opening, but Mm -hmm. to make that space in the, in the subconscious and in the brain. It's so important. We are not just physical people, right? We're emotional, spiritual, physical, everything's connected. I love that. So you talked about trainers. What, what exactly are, are trainers? Yeah. So 
vaginal, you might hear both. Vaginal trainers, dilators are the same thing. Okay. So basically they're used to help adapt muscles in order to be able to have penetrative intimacy activities or even tampons, um, speculums, you know, anything that's basically functional penetrative activities. That's what I like to say, call them, but um, in a non-threatening pain-free way. So I'll show, I'll show and describe what they are, but, and that might make more sense. So there's all these different sizes of them. Um, and so this is what they look like. So for those that can't see me, they're basically penis shaped um, in a sense, but there's, there's all these different sizes. And so there's a handle and hope in her.com has these specific ones. Okay? okay. I'll have a link in the show notes for, for hope in her. Yes. And then I'll, I'll say another one in a second, but okay. this is the handle that um, the hope in her ones, and it just kind of clicks into it. Basically oh. the handle, I don't know how to describe it. <laughs> I thought it was like a double sided one, like you were clicking it into <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were clicking it into another one. You can like double. I don't know. I went in a whole different direction. I'm sorry. There may be some like what you're thinking. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> okay. To re- rewind. <laughs> the base of the trainer is more flat and round than what is inserted and so the flat and round side clicks into the holder and so then there's a handle looking thing that that basically is the part that you hold to insert it and so like for those watching so i'm going to kind of demonstrate so what i do if i'm treating patients with vaginal trainers and dilators i put just like one finger pressure at the end of the trainer Okay. okay and so i'm not forcing it ever it's just kind of one it's only one finger pressure and so as I'm inserting it, let's say, you know, the muscles are relaxed, it's going in, going in, and then let's say they get tense at a certain depth, okay, or like a certain size. If they're tense and I feel that resistance here, then honestly, I'm just meeting the resistance where it's at. So I'm just okay. kind of keeping it there, one finger pressure, just enough that the muscles can know something is there, but okay. not enough to where it's like dangerous to them. Okay, or okay. you know, as a threat, yeah, where so they want to like tighten up more. Them with it, right? Just yeah, slowly, exactly. Inserting. Okay, so you'll find that as I'm here, you know, and then we're just chatting it up, really. Like you're just kind of letting time, time go on. As time goes on, the muscles will adapt to what is being inserted, and then they'll start to relax because then okay. they'll be like, "Oh, this is a, an okay thing." You know, my pain's decreasing, all that. So as they relax, it might insert a little more, and then if it tenses up. I'm just keeping the pressure on. And so there's a, you know, there's a process to this. So I tell patients as they're doing this at home, I want to keep it three and under. So three out of 10 pain or less because okay. anything more than that, the nervous system senses it as a threat and that's not helping us at all because we want to kind of keep nervous system in a relaxed state. And so I tell patients, you know, get in a comfortable position. If you want to play some music, some patients do it in the bathtub. Some patients prop themselves up with pillows on their bed or on their floor. You know, make it an experience that is relaxing in a sense. And so I have them never go through more than three in one session. So example, and granted disclaimer, you know, this is so individualized to each person. This is just general, kind of in general. If it like goes in, glides in no tension, nothing like that, then they have the green light. Okay, let's go to the next size. And so then they'll do the next size, but never more than three. And I tip, I never do more than three in one session either. Like even if a patient has like the one, the three sizes I think we're on and that we've been progressing to, if one session, all of them are like pain-free, all good, they glow like minimal resistance. I don't just keep going. Three is the limit. I have also patients use these before intimacy, um, to just help the muscles kind of get adapted and, and used to the stimulus in a non-threatening way before moving to intimacy. Um, and that seems to help where, like them well as they're progressing through this journey of um, having pain-free. Okay. And of course, right? So they get bigger. What's the biggest? You know, maybe that's not an appropriate question. <laughs> I'm like purposely not showing you the biggest one in case people are watching. Yeah, like, oh, okay, yeah, don't do that. Don't do I, that. Like, fine. like, oh my gosh, you're good. You're good. You're oh, good. okay. So this was the Hope and Her ones that I just showed. Okay, this is um, intimate intimate rose.com. 
So that is another another one. And I also have a like a coupon code to give you to get some coupon off. Yes. Um, this is more silicone, so it's more flimsy than So do you metal. recommend the silicone over the plastic or it really it really is up to the patient. Both are really both are good. I I forget what the handle because these are the Hope and Her ones are the ones I use in the clinic. Um, the intimate rose, I forget what the handle is like because it's not, these don't have like clicking, anything right. clicking. So I'm unsure as to how the handle is with intimate rose, but I really like the hope in her handle because it, okay. it's very sturdy. And I've, I've heard some people, if they buy them on Amazon, you know, they have found different ones. And if they buy them on Amazon, that the handle might come undone or it's not very secure. So that's important. Um, I've but, seen I've yeah. seen one that had like um like a little hole on the bottom so you can like kind of stick your finger through oh. and just kind of you know so that it's like you don't hold it it just has yeah. like a, you just stick your finger through oh it kind of makes gotcha it to, yeah you know what I mean? yeah totally so you would like hook it and then yeah you, you would it. hook it with your finger oh. or you, you know your thumb if you're going you know that right way. yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool. I haven't seen those. So or it that doesn't one. detach. Right. You don't have to worry about that. Right. It's all part of it. So now we're talking about inserting this into our vagina. Obviously, we need some kind of lubricant. Yes. So let's yes. talk about lubricant. Yes. So there's so many different lubricants out there. My recommendation would be to stay away from the ones that have a ton of ingredients or, you know, that have like fancy, fancy names, I guess. I don't, I don't know, but keep it basic. Keep, keep it basic. Keep yes. it as basic as you can. Good, okay. clean lubricant. So here's, I have some names that we can post too, but um, Uber Lube is good. So this is water-based okay. and I think all of these I'm saying are, are water-based. Um, Uber Lube is good. It's, it's definitely good too. If you have like issues with dryness during intimacy okay. too. Uber Lube is the one I recommend with that. Um, Good Clean Love is another one that um, this one is organic specifically. And it's all natural ingredients. And then Desert Harvest, you, I think it's just desertharvest.com, but they have lubricants with lidocaine specifically in it. Oh, So that can help with pain. And I have had, I have had patients like Desert Harvest a lot. Um, okay for that. And then what I treat in the clinic with, it's called slippery stuff. And okay, so I've heard of that one. Yeah. That's the one that I use. Um, and so then these I, are just samples that I have. Oh, and just the, you know, just a disclaimer with these, I know that, you know, topical medications or anything like, like that for the vulva area, yeah. don't put the medication on and then do the lubricant in trainers okay. in a sense because just the mixture of the lubricant and the medication that could possibly, you know, take the medication off or something okay. like that. So that's just like a tidbit. Yeah. Information with so, time. so how long should we wait? Like, let's say, so, so do you, do you just like, is there like a certain amount of time we should wait or should we just not do it that day? Like yeah. if, if it's our day for, cause if, we, if we're on a maintenance and we're doing twice a week, mm -hmm. should we just skip the dilators on that day or just do it before we put it on our clobetasol? How, right. How yeah. Know? Honestly, either one. So you can okay. just not do it that day or do lubricants first and then follow up with the medication. So when we're working with the trainers, do you feel like some like someone could just like go to YouTube and kind of just watch a YouTube video and start doing this by themselves? Or do you highly recommend having a pelvic floor physical therapist kind of teach us how to do it? Yeah, I would recommend going to someone to teach you a public health PT, just because there's just so many, there's so much out there. And, you know, everyone presents differently. So okay. someone that I might recommend, okay, yeah, let's start with the smallest one. You know, this is how I want you to do it. Could be vastly different from someone who has more scarring and is mm -hmm. might not be ready for trainers yet. Okay. And so even if they think they're ready for them, they might benefit a lot with just kind of finger and manual work on the scar tissue and tension right. before going right to the trainers. And then too, just, you know, those with, those with LS, the, the tissue is very sensitive. So yes. 
it's important then with the education component of, okay, if you notice bleeding, you know, when you're doing it, that, that could be too much, you know, we need to think about dosage in a sense and maybe how you're doing it. So there's all of these different factors coming into play that you wouldn't get if you watched just the YouTube video and went for it in a sense. Right. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Going back to the loops. What if the doctor said they only wanted us to use natural oils like uh, coconut oil or olive oil and things like that? Can we use that as a lube? Can we bring our own lubes? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Any of those are basically green light, fair game. Um, Yeah. And if you have your lubricant and it's like, this is what this works for me, this works for my tissues the best. Absolutely. You can bring it. Um, to treatment sessions and we can use that. I've had patients do that before. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. One of the ladies in my group, she shared this today. She said that she went to her pelvic floor physical therapist and was told it's not a big deal. LS is not a big deal. It's just a skin thing. And then she said that the first five visits, all she did was like abdominal abdominal massages. Mm. And then... um, I think she she also said that she was working, I guess, on the clitoral adhesion. Yeah. And she tore her. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, she was, she's not had a very good um, experience with pelvic floor physical yeah. therapist. Yeah. And I think that, again, that just messes with that subconscious totally. that this is the person that's supposed to be helping you. Totally. Yeah. And it's they're doing the opposite. You totally. Know, so. Oh, my blood pressure. My heart hurts for her. My blood pressure's off. Yeah, <laughs> we told her it's time for you to is, find someone new. Yes. Um, yes. And that's so why. And I love how you brought up what should they ask. I mean, what should they ask? I, I highly recommend calling if you find, and I can give you some resources to find a public health PT wherever that would you are. Be amazing. But that would um, be amazing. Is there know, like call? a certain website or anything? Yeah, there's a couple. Um, okay. Pelvic Guru. Dot com okay. is one. Pelvic um, Rehab dot com is another, and then International Pain Society I think has some, but the first two for sure. Okay, perfect. Um, we'll have those in fun. the show notes as well. And yeah. so we just we can just call around and yes. um, just ask the different questions and see see what their process is. See, yeah, we definitely recommend we. Be, see someone who's knowledgeable about LS, right? For sure. Yes. Hands down. Because I mean, just how there's a ton of, let's say ortho PTs around, there might be like the shoulder guy or whoever. Right. There's a lot of pelvic, pelvic health diagnoses. And I highly recommend like you're the patient, you know, advocate for yourself, ask them maybe hard questions of what about LS and just, just feel out their vibes, feel out their personality, their sensitivity, you know, all of that is so important, especially so, you know, with that person that told you that story that, that, that doesn't happen. That just, yeah, that breaks my heart. Yeah. It's, it's unfortunate yeah. that there's, you know, people who in all professions, not totally, just, you know, not just pelvic floor physical therapy, but in for all sure. professions that for just sure. should not be there. <laughs> totally. Yeah, for sure. I know we discussed a little bit about who's ready for pelvic floor physical therapy. Yeah. Um, I know you see you created a kind of quiz or screening for us. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So basically, it's just going to ask you questions um, basically about your symptoms and it'll say yes, no. And, you know, if you say yes on so many, then yes, you should probably see. However, I just feel like it's important to just have a public health PT person on your on your team. Even if yeah. maybe you don't need them right now, start looking at least, finding someone that you feel like you vibe well with because it's a journey, like what you said, and there's such a spectrum. And so that can just be comforting in itself to know that you have someone on that side of your team. So some specific questions, we talked about them today a little bit, but if you have pain with intimacy, you know, that's common, but it's not normal. So that like, you don't have to just suck it up and, you know, kind of push through that. There's, there's hope for it. If your urine stream has changed. So I haven't written the right one for yet. If your urine stream stream has changed since having LS. So that can mean, 
if it's dribbling now more than usual or if it's deviating to one side, that can be some indication indicators there. Post boy dribble, which is what we say, but it's like if you empty your bladder and then you stand up and more comes out or you feel like, you know, you're washing your hands and you got to go again and more comes out, we call that post boy post boy dribble. Or if just in general, any change in bowel or bladder functions, all of those things, pelvic floor muscles in that area are involved in. So those are, those are a few. That's so interesting. You can find that quiz at lssupport.net slash PFPT. For pelvic floor physical therapy, PFPT. I want to talk about a little bit more about that as far as um, urinating, having to constantly go urinate. I did not equate that. So like for me, my... LS started after I had a hysterectomy and I had a hysterectomy of maybe about my youngest was a year and a half. Mm -hmm. She was still pretty young. Um, But I've definitely noticed that I have to go to the bathroom a lot Um, and that I cannot hold it as long as I used to. Mm -hmm. And I just figured, you know, oh, it's just me getting old. It's just, you know, something I got to deal with. But you're saying that is a possible indicator that I need to get pelvic floor physical therapy. Yeah, right. So that can be an indicator of the function, at least of your pelvic floor muscles, whether if it's a strength issue, which is an underactive issue um, of the muscles, or it can even be an overactive issue if if your muscles are you know, being shortened or or tense a little bit, that can still contribute to that. And so treatment will look different for everyone, but it would be assessing your muscles, training them in the way that, you know, what we find, um, either strengthening or decreasing tension and kind of retraining them in a sense to help with the bladder because the bladder is connected to the pelvic floor muscles. They can, they talk to each other, they communicate. So the pelvic floor fatigue can help with that. So let me follow up with this then. Um, I know a lot of the ladies in my group have also LS on the anus. Mm. Does pelvic floor physical therapy have anything to do with anal LS? Yeah. 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 So just how, you know, I described treating the vulva and the tissues at perineal body or, or clitoral, you know, adhesions with the anus, we can also do manual techniques to help like perianal tissue to help decrease the tension there. Um, and then, you know, I'm trained in intrarectal. There's different tiers of like pelvic health, you know, so that just like intravaginal, there's also intrarectal treatments and assessments of that side of the pelvic floor muscles wow. more directly. Yeah. Wow. So even if you have LS just on your anus, you should still get pelvic floor physical therapy or at least, totally. you know, have one on your team mm-hmm. so they can assess when they can, when they, when it's their turn to step in and right. help you in, in that part of your journey. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. That's yep. Awesome. And so just how it can affect urinary can affect bowel, you know, bowel movement too. And that just made me think of something as far as, you know, what you said with calling around and asking questions there's with public health PT, there's, there's different courses Mm-hmm. So, you know, I would ask at least like what their experience is with courses, you know, what kind of level they're at, if they okay. just intravaginally trained, or maybe they haven't even taken that course yet, or, you know, intrarectally trained, there's all these different trainings, um, okay. just so there's trainings, continuing education for anything. But um, that could be something good to ask. So we're, so we're looking that they have intravaginal training okay. and intrarectal training. Yep. Perfect. So now with COVID, we are... Yeah all kind of stuck at home. Some pelvic floor physical therapists are not seeing people in person. Mm -hmm. Um, What's the whole telehealth situation like? Like Yeah. So um, we're doing telehealth. I'm seeing people in person and telehealth right now, but basically telehealth, it's kind of just like this. Like I'm seeing you, we're talking, we're seeing, talking through a screen, you know, it's kind of like FaceTime and I can do telehealth for anyone that's in Pennsylvania. So, I believe, you know, for PTs that are doing telehealth, it's usually they can do it within their state. So I can talk to anyone that's in Pennsylvania, even if we talk about screening, kind of just their symptoms and going from there. But yeah, that's basically what it is. It's like FaceTime in a sense. 
So if you're not allowed to go in person, then really all you can do, though, at, at that time is kind of the screening and right. kind of talking about where you want to go with the, you know, where you're trying to get on your journey. Do you totally. do any kind of work with them as far as like the mental? Because we were talking about the mental side of the physical therapy. Do you yeah. work with them even th- with that? We can, yeah, we can talk through like all of that education about the nervous system, mind body connection, all of that. And two, I can help, I can help them find a pelvic health PT that might be closer to them okay. in Pennsylvania. Um, and I can look through my own resources too and help them, you know, be on their team to help them find someone that they might be able to go to in person. Oh, um, that's, good. that's closer to them if it's hours away. Yeah, that's, that's great. So uh, let's talk a little bit about pregnancy and LS and pelvic floor physical therapy. While um, a woman is pregnant, do you recommend still going through pelvic floor physical therapy? Or is that something that they should wait till after birth? That's a good question. So I still, I still recommend it. Um, we can do, it depends, obviously it depends per pregnancy, but, um, with the doctor's consent and recommendation, there can still be perennial body stretching, which can also help with delivery of the baby. So even if someone has past pregnancies and deliveries and they have torn or had an episiotomy, scar tissue then forms. And then if they have, you know, LS2, scar tissue upon scar tissue in a sense. And so, with pelvic floor PT still, if they're pregnant and the doctor clears it, we can stretch, gently stretch in that perennial body for this from the scar tissue and also to help make that tissue more extensible for delivery or anything like that. And as they're pregnant too, depending, you know, what, what their symptoms are and what their pain's like and all of that stuff, we can do some intravaginal um, treatments too, if it's cleared by the doctor. By the doctor, right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you recommend dilators while they're pregnant too, or it's just basically just mm-hmm. kind of massages? That would probably depend, but I would lean more towards more just massage. Mm-hmm. And it depends their intimacy level at the time with their partner. Mm-hmm. But that's that's usually a case by case okay. basis. Okay. Yeah. That's a good question. Perfect. Ashley, this has been amazing. Yes. I have learned so freaking much. Yay. I appreciate you spending the time and talking to us and educating us because I I did not know. I did not know even half of this stuff. Yes, Thank you're so you. welcome. I love it. Thank you. And we'll definitely have to have you back so we can go more in depth on some of these specific issues because this is just an overall of of uh, pelvic floor physical therapy. And right. I would love to just dive deeper into yes. all the different aspects. So. Sounds good. Yay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Did I not tell you that that was going to be an amazing conversation? I hope you have so many notes. If not, please Go check out the website show notes because we got it all written out for you, baby. No worries. I want to hear from you. What did you learn? What questions do you still have? Because I want to get her back on here, answer your questions and get you even more information. She is an amazing pelvic floor physical therapist. She was one of the keynote speakers at Lichen Sclerosis Support Network's first holistic healing summit and one of the most popular presenters. And I hope you enjoyed her just as much. So just to give you a little bit of update on what's going on with the Lichen Sclerosis Support Network, we have our board, we have our mission, our vision, and we have our two cornerstone programs, the Check Your Vova program and the provider education program. Both of these working simultaneously are going to help people get diagnosed quicker, make sure they get the treatment and the care that they need and deserve from doctors who are knowledgeable and know how to give the resources that are available to patients. 
If you can, support Lichen Sclerosis Support Network. Their links will be in the show notes. And spread the word, because without people knowing about them, they won't be able to complete their mission. Next week, we're going to have another doctor come and talk to us. But this time, we're talking about all things grooming, from bathing, using the restroom, to a question I get oh so much, how can I remove the hair down there? We're going to be answering all of those questions and more next week. Make sure you've subscribed on your podcast app, and I will see you next week. Bye.